You could take two years of nutrition education, two years, like special, specialized nutrition education, or you could go and learn a, a two years of therapy and, be, and become a therapist. You know he's going to be more qualified to coach someone to lose weight? Therapist. therapist for sure. Mm -hmm. Because it's behavior. It's not the calories and the macros that make the biggest difference in terms of long-term success. Well, and also too, I imagine there's, you know, a bit of doctors out there that are <clears throat> jaded because of uh, patients and, and clients coming in that um, they, maybe they do spend a little bit of time trying to describe how to eat healthier, or like, you know, move and, and add exercise into the mix. And they just don't want to hear it. They want to just get the pill. They want to just get the, the answer that's like easy and it's going to solve their issues. Some of the worst advice that clients would bring to me when it came to diet and exercise actually came from their doctors, uh, real doctors. And it was also some of the most challenging ones to overcome. You guys remember encountering Boy, some of this stuff? You just been trying to start a fight in there, aren't you? No, this I mean, well, look, stir the hornet's nest. No, this is true, and um, it, it was so a couple things. Very frustrating. But yeah, way. I would get, I would get clients who get really really bad advice from their doctors, like um, I'm going to do this HCG diet. Yeah. That was one where they went 500 Stop calories. Stop deadlifting because it's going to hurt your back. Yeah, or, or uh, don't squat anymore, don't move anymore, don't do this thing anymore. Um, I actually had clients many times come to me with these uh, liquid diets. That their client, that their doctors would put them on, where they would just have shakes to lose weight, and it was so hard to overcome or to talk through because I'm countering their doctor. Yeah, and there's two challenges to that. One is you have to be very careful because the way regulations work, if you don't want to say something that you you never want to say anything that'll hurt somebody, but if you say something that counters a doctor, um, you could get you could be quite liable, regardless of what that is. Mm -hmm. And number two, because doctors are held to such a high standard for for some very justifiable reasons. Yeah, the ultimate authority. If you tell your client, no, I don't think you should just have powder, liquid calories for the next 30 days to lose weight, it was hard to overcome because they're like, well, it's my doctor. This is my doctor. They're, they know what they're talking about. They've gone to a lot of school. Um, you know, I've been seeing them for a long time. It's like, well, how do I, how do I overcome this? Yeah, this was really hard for me, uh, especially considering I don't think I have a silver tongue like you do. So I think I, I struggle with this for most of my career because they are already put in that authority position. And unless you can uh, articulate your argument better than the doctor can, it's a really, really, really tough one to overcome. Even if you know better, right? I would know better, but the advice they're given, and you gave a perfect example of, you know, oh, do these shakes for the next 30 days. And that, that, that became a thing for a second. It was. You guys remember that? It was mm -hmm. super common. Yeah. Well, because what, what happened is like, okay, you get you get clients and there, there's exceptions to this rule, right? And I understand where it came from, right? If, if, uh, if a client was so morbidly obese that- It was like an emergency. Yeah, like it's an emergency to get this weight off. Obviously, this person has struggled most of their life, if not all their life with weight and probably tried all kinds of different diets and weren't, weren't successful- so it was like a it, this is an emergency way to get get weight off of them because it was a life or death matter. So there's so to me there there are exceptions to the rule where I understand where that logic came from, but that wasn't a majority of the people. That was yeah. not most of my clients. Most of my clients were in a manageable place. It wasn't life or death where they needed to get that weight off. They but they did need to. I mean, it was life or death as far as you know they continued on this path. They mm -hmm. were going to die, but it wasn't like if they didn't do if they didn't figure this out next week they were going to die yeah now i want to be clear i have tremendous respect for uh, physicians and doctors i have a lot of friends that are doctors um, at one point i trained a lot um and i i always ask for clearance and i would always consult with doctors because mm -hmm. what they do know they know very very well um and you need some of that information um, so that's really really important but when it came to exercise and nutrition general exercise and nutrition aside from their specialties their advice was typically not that great. Um, and it, it could cause a lot of problems because they're such high positions of authority. So I, I would get clients that would come to me either with these prescription diet pills or they'd be on, you know, or the doctor would say something like, don't squat anymore. Now, if it wasn't coming from their osteopath or someone who specifies in that, you know, it was specific in that particular field, I'd be like, what do you mean your general practitioner told you not to squat anymore? because your knee hurts? And I say, well, I think I know I, I think I know why your knee hurts. You have these this dysfunction here. We can work on that. And yeah, yeah, but they said I shouldn't do any lower body exercises. Yeah. And then you're put in a really tough position mm -hmm. because as a trainer, you require doctor's clearance. So I would actually, I've actually this happened quite uh, twice to me. I'd get on the phone with the doctor and I'd have to explain myself and say, well, here's why we're going to squat. Here's how we're going to squat. 
here's what's going to happen. And yeah. thankfully through the conversation, the doctor said, oh, okay, you, you know what you're doing. I trust you. But well, it was intimidating. Well, and it's addressing the symptom. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, it's an easy way for them to avoid the pain of the symptom of the pain, but we're not addressing anything, you know, going into the future in terms of strengthening and supporting the body to bring it back to, you know, alleviate completely. Welcome back. Here's the giveaway for today's Mind Pump episode. MAPS Power Lift. It's a program specifically to get you better at the power lifts. Squat, bench press, and deadlift. You can get it for free. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all of those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won MAPS Powerlift. Also, we got a sale going on right now. MAPS Starter, a great beginner strength training program, is 50% off. And the Prime Bundle. This includes MAPS Prime Pro, MAPS Prime. These are correctional exercise mobility programs. Those are or also 50% off. So MAPS Starter, Prime Bundle, both 50% off. You can find them at mapsfitnessproducts.com, but you have to use the code AUGUST50 for the discount. All right, here comes the show. So before we get into hammering doctors right now, I want to defend, defend them also because I think in their defense, there are probably more bad trainers you could make the case there's more bad trainers than there are bad doctors. And if you're a doctor and you hear your client is training with some young trainer and your knees hurt, you are probably going to lean on the Oops. great point. You know, I'm going to be like, I don't know who this kid is. He doesn't know who Adam is training a client. And they probably yeah. have experience with, with their client, with their patients getting hurt. Right. From crappy. Right. Workouts. And so you listen, don't listen to this young kid who's telling you, you need to squat That's all this great. way. Yeah, Good point. You Let your body heal completely. Right. Stay away so from these movements. So in their defense, uh, I, and, and remember we, we were a part of the, the real big wave of training, like the popularity of trainers. We were on the big front end of the beginning of that wave, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. And through a majority of that, and of course, still doing that in our career today. And so, you know, early on, trainers were not as knowledgeable and as skilled as they are today. I mean, I watched that evolution happen in my career, like where trainers became very, very knowledgeable. Yeah, it started out with just trainers were just people who trained themselves and were fit. Yeah, and, and, and that's right. You didn't even, the certification courses were not what they are now. Yeah, my very mm -hmm. first certification was IFPA. So this was before even 24 Hour Fitness. I was already looking into becoming a trainer. And the national cert that I had, which was nationally recognized, was IFPA. It was literally a take-home test that I could fill out and send in. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you literally could look up all the answers, fill it out. And then I was wow. I was technically a certified personal trainer after that. So that's what I, I think. And, and so you got to know that doctors yeah. rem saw that, remembered that, felt that, and probably experienced that. And so I, I do want to defend that. Now, I also think that we're, we're in a totally different era now. I, they're trainers now, um, and this is again an overgeneralization would be to say that they're all great because there's just as many probably bad ones today. But the education level of trainers, because there's more money there now, that that wasn't a, a that wasn't a career path twenty something years ago. You didn't you didn't hear kids in in junior high going like, when I grow up, I want to be a personal trainer yeah. one day. Like that wasn't a thing until later on. But now it's a legitimate career it's path. More, it's more competitive, so you need to be better. Yeah. to do what you do. There's better information. I, I that's a really really good point. And you know, mm -hmm. I I have really good relationship with a lot of doctors. You know, I've said many times at one point I trained quite a few uh, physicians and doctors. And one thing that struck me was. Um, First off, we all know that doctors are highly educated. Uh, becoming a, a doctor, especially in a spe especially when you're specialized uh, or you're a surgeon, it's a tremendous amount of formal education, uh, and it weeds out a lot of people that just can't hack it. It's a very challenging job. Um, they're also extremely intelligent. I was surprised to to see the hobbies that a lot of these doctors had. Were like I couldn't believe they had first off hobbies because if you look at the hours of like the typical surgeon, <laughs> yeah, where do they fit that in? It's crazy, but it, they'd be like, oh yeah, for you know, I'm also a classically trained pianist and I you know I do that on the side, or oh yeah, I learn Latin or whatever. I'm like, okay, also these a are pilot, <laughs> yeah, or yeah, yeah, I, I'm yep. a pilot. Yeah, really, really intelligent people. And then also they, I had this perception of doctors as a kid that oh these are people that make a lot of money, so maybe people go into this field to make money. That's not true. Now the only time I kind of encountered that a little bit was when I trained plastic, plastic surgeon. surgeon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the other doctors, it, they were all passion driven, yep. totally passion driven. They loved what they did. Many of them volunteered uh, their time on the side to help and that kind of stuff. So um, tremendously intelligent, very educated, smart, 
you know, people, but very specialized. This yeah. is what people need to realize is that they're very, very specialized and their education when it comes to exercise is zero. Mm. And when it comes to nutrition, I believe is a semester or a course. Yeah. I think it's one course semester. Now, Sal, this is required. largely uh, just in uh, Western medicine, right? Yes. Because in Eastern medicine, they, they, they look at medicine differently, like more holistically than we do. And so I think because of our, our advancements and how good we are at handling acute issues, We've become very specialized, which is unique to our our country, right? Like, it is it's not like it, that everywhere. It is, but if you work with like an Eastern medicine um, specialist, they will work with nutrition differently mm -hmm. uh, and movement differently. It's a, it's a very different practice. They tend to focus more on it's holistic and more on kind of root cause type yeah. of stuff. Um, not saying it's superior. I think in some cases it is. I think in many other cases it's not. Yeah. But uh, Western medicine doctors are very very specialized. And what they do. And if you look at the required courses that they take in nutrition, it's small. It's very small. It's like, I think it's a semester, if I'm not mistaken, in most cases. And yeah, when it comes to exercise, there's none. I've had a few doctors that have, you know, I had as clients that were saying that they just breezed through the nutrition section. Um, and typically it was like the general practitioners because um, you get so many patients every day and it's like it became kind of this thing like um, this pattern of like how much information can you really relate to each patient and then what was most effective with that and so you know nutrition was very brief like even if they bring it up as, as an option so. to it's totally brief and what they tend to communicate or what they would communicate to clients of mine was more of what you hear when you go online about losing weight so they would say things like Oh, you just eat less and just move more would be their typical advice or um, go sign up for a class, you know, workout class, or I would have, I would have clients come back. Well, my doctor said cut carbs and I say cut carbs and the doc and say, well, yeah, it worked really well for him. So that's what he told me to do. I'm like, okay, well, you're getting advice. That's a little bit, maybe you're, you're from a smarter, more educated person, than the average person, but the average, but the advice is coming across the same. And because again, they have such a, uh, that authority it was really hard to counter it. In fact, oftentimes I would not counter it. I'd let it run its course. Mm -hmm. you, okay, your you had told to. Me. Yeah. You kind of had to sometimes. I mean, at the end of the day, we're still in a service business and these people are hiring and paying you. And then if you're sitting there arguing with them and fighting with their doctor the whole time, so you a lot of times- You'll lose. Yeah, you'd have to submit. A lot of times you have to submit and say, okay, we'll, we'll do it your way first. And then mm -hmm. you know, as we go through, I'll explain to you why this is happening, why that's happening, and why we're not seeing the results that you want to see. Yeah. So You know, it was really illuminating was as when I would train a lot of these doctors, when I first started um, getting, so I would train one and then they started referring each other. And so then I started training quite a bit is that they would come to me, I would do my assessment, like I would always do with anyone. And because they know anatomy much more than the average person, and they understand the terminology, I would be able to speak to them in a particular way. And then they would inevitably say something like, um, I can't uh, I can't do any squatting, or I can't bend my knee be below be more than 45 degrees, no overhead pressing for me. And they would tell me why. You know, I tore my infraspinatus, I have, you know, um, I have some AC joint uh, problems. I had it resected a few years ago. Or yeah, I can't squat below you know forty five degrees because I have chondromalacia. Or and they would have all the reasons why yeah. and tell me why they can't do it. And I and I it was very illuminating to me because I'd hear this and I'd know because I've worked with many many people in this situation. And I'd know like well we'll see we'll see how your movement works and through strengthening the body it's very likely you'll be able to do more than you think. Right. And I would tell them that. It's very likely, but we'll take it very slow and we'll see what's happened mm -hmm. uh, with your body. And they would be blown away. I remember one lady in particular, she's like, I can't squat below 45 degrees. I got all these problems and she listed her issues. I mean, six months later, we're doing full squats and she was like blown away. But what's good about this is that they started sending me their patients mm -hmm. because they saw like, oh, it's there's much more to this than uh, than I thought. Well, a lot of the, you have to think it's probably like the national certifications, right? So when you get, it, I remember that having this moment too, where I had gone through multiple national certifications, and then and a lot of the stuff that they were teaching us for as form and technique was you know, stopping at ninety degrees mm -hmm. and not going below parallel on your squatting yeah, and nothing, behind your, nothing behind your neck, like all these kind of basic rules that like I feel are not true, but 
the reason why they do that is because obviously the, the risk of someone potentially hurting themselves, they may be liable if yes. they're teaching that. So I imagine doctors are are held to the same standard where it's like, you tell your doctor, oh, my knees hurt or this bother me and I'm getting ready to hire this personal trainer. What can I can't do? They're going to go like, uh, don't, don't squat, don't do this, don't do that. Because if they say, oh, you should squat, it's really good for you. Or you should deadlift, it's going to mm -hmm. be really good for you. And then they go do those movements and then end up getting hurt. I imagine that they're held liable for that. And so that's probably another reason why they push that so hard. Yeah. And also when you go and you get a procedure done, uh, like a surgery of some type, they, they, you'll get these standard answers like, okay, now that we've repaired your ACL, no more lateral movement or no more whatever, um, you know, no stopping quickly or, and, you know, and, and, and we know as trainers that if you don't rehab and strengthen, that's true. Okay, that's good advice. However, you're going to lose the ability when you never practice that, right. and you're just going to decline even faster. And I do want to say, by the way, that it's it's changing uh, quite a bit. Yeah, I'm starting to see the advice start to change a little bit, mm -hmm. like the reluctance to uh, have people use a cane or a walker. That didn't happen early in my career. It was like, oh, you fell, use a walker. Now I, you know, now I'm hearing people say. My doctor's trying to prevent me from going on my walker because once I do, then I'm going to change my movement patterns. It's going to, and I'm going to be stuck on it type of deal. Yeah, you see, uh, there is a, a bit of a shift, and um, you see more integrative uh, type of approaches and holistic uh, type of approaches. And functional medicine is a thing now that wasn't really when we were trainers, you know, way back when. And so, um, it there's def definitely been a big shift in the medical community to start, you know, kind of incorporating. Um, you know, some of these practices and getting uh, in touch with the physical therapists and, and you know, training and, and kind of creating um, that opportunity to to send their patients in that direction, which is so there's I see glimmers of hope. Yeah. Also, because it's such a highly regulated field. So medicine is extreme. It's very, very highly regulated. And I, of course, understand why a lot of the information that they get is through the regulatory process. Right. So doctors were were advocating low fat, for example, for a long time when low fat was the official, like this is the cause of obesity is too much fat, right? They were advocating for the use of vegetable oils instead of uh, traditional or, or, or natural oils for a very, very long time because this is, these are, this is the official, you know, guidelines. They would not advocate for strength training for a long time because strength training didn't have any studies to support its benefits, mainly because there were no studies that were done mm -hmm. on strength training for longevity. So the forms of exercise. So I'd get clients that were obese that their doctor would send me and the client would say, my doctor said I need to focus on cardiovascular activity Yeah, and that and strength training. Cut calories. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to do strength training. I need to focus on cardiovascular activity. Well, that's because that's the official narrative and they, that's the information they get through their channels yeah. through the regulatory <laughs> process. So, right. you know, the, it can, you can be behind, you, you basically can be behind on what's actually happening and working. Like when I'm training people, I see what's happening, what's working with my experience. So I know like, oh, this method's actually far more effective than the official narrative. Well, I mean, that brings to your next point of that. They just lack that experience. It's what it's the same thing that when I see these online coaches and trainers who have never coached somebody in person and there's just, you can have all the knowledge, you know, you could read all the books and un even understand that you've actually gone through the nutrition certifications, but until you go out there and you actually apply it to clients and help them through that process, I mean, that's not, it, it takes that before it comes full circle for you on the ability to communicate because the books don't address like all the behavior stuff. No. And we know that that's the bulk of it. The bulk of it is, it is adherence. Can I even get this person to do X, Y, and Z, even if I know scientifically this is the best answer for them or what they should do, mm -hmm. the reality is if what they should do, if you know, because you've actually gone and coached enough people, that the the fail rate on that is 90%, well, then it's no longer the most ideal thing we should do. Right. Because yes, it's it, it's backed by science as the best answer for that situation. But if, if 90% of the people that attempt that best answer and fail at it, yeah. it's not successful. So I have to think of other ways to get them to that same desired well, outcome. Well, when you're working with diet and exercise, it's not just, um, you know, plugging in numbers like, uh, okay, calories, proteins, fats, carbs, here's your workout. Here you go and go do it. If it was that easy, we'd have no obesity issue at all because the answers are out there. What it is, is the coaching process and working with people through that process and helping them develop behaviors and helping them change the relationships with their bodies, change the relationships with nutrition. So they don't reach for food 
for, for comfort or to numb themselves, or they understand the real values of food and they change how they perceive it, how they enjoy it, or they don't enjoy it. And with, with exercise, the same thing, this is a long process. It's not here. Follow. Look, as a trainer, that's what I did early days, early days as a trainer, I just did meal plans and gave people workouts. Here's mm -hmm. your, Oh, your calories. Here's your calories. Cause I know how many you need to, to, to lose weight. Here's the workout. Just follow this. Well, that fails. It doesn't work that. So it's a conversation that takes time and coaching and doctors don't have the time no. to do that. And they don't have the training to do that. You know, and you know, who's more qualified. I'll tell you something right now. You could take two years of nutrition education, two years, like special specialized nutrition education, or you could go and learn a, a two years of therapy and be, and become a therapist. You know, he's gonna be more qualified to coach someone to lose weight therapist, therapist for sure, mm -hmm. because it's behavior. It's not the calories and the macros that make the biggest difference in terms of long-term success. Well, and also too, I imagine there's, you know, a bit of doctors out there that are <clears throat> jaded because of uh, patients and, and clients coming in that um, they, maybe they do spend a little bit of time trying to describe how to eat healthier, or like, you know, move and, and add exercise into the mix. And they just don't want to hear it. They want to just get the pill. They want to just get the, the answer that's like easy and it's going to solve their issues uh, to where, you know, enough times I feel like, you know, it might be at a place where it's like, well, I'm not even going to, you know, bring it up. Yeah. Well, going back to the, the psychology of what you were saying, I mean, it's how we how we do diets with people today, right? So, you know, early on as a trainer, I made the same mistake. This client is this big. They want to lose this much weight. This is their macro breakdown. This is the calorie restriction I'm putting them on. Here's a list of the foods they say they like to eat or don't eat. Here's your meal plan. Yeah. And go follow it. And that is all backed by science. You know, it's all, yeah. we, if we, they follow it, that's right. Weight. That's right. We we can we can support this based off of this. We have enough information now that we could figure out pretty close what that person should be eating from a macro and calorie perspective to get them to their goal. Problem is, I've done that so many times and have failed so many times. I realize that's not a winning strategy, even though the science supports that is the answer. But what really ends up working way better is actually not worrying so much about all those things, assessing where their diet is and going like, oh, they're lacking in these things. So instead of me taking food away, even though this client wants to lose 30, 40 pounds, I'm actually going to add something into the diet. Complete opposite yeah. of what anything would support scientifically. Because if you go, hey, this person needs to lose weight from what they're eating, your coach and trainer says they want you to add something to the diet, I, I, I would fail I would not as far as I would not pass the scientific right. test yeah. on that. But the truth is that's what works is what we know is that when you have a client that you're playing with their psychology, you're not telling them they can't do something they can't have. I tell them I want them to add this into their diet. You know, just by them focusing on that, naturally other things fall off there. Look, the answer to, uh, you know, alcoholism to stop drinking alcohol. The answer, the answer yeah, to right. a drug addiction is to stop doing the drug. Yeah. Oh, you're poor? Just make more money and save more money. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answers. Try harder. But that's not, that doesn't work. Why? Because we're not robots, okay? And the coaching process is where the value is. A really good trainer will tell you this. Somebody who's been training people for a long time will tell you that the, the their real success, the long-term success comes through that process. Doctors have no experience in that. So even if a doctor is educated in some of these things like nutrition and exercise. And they, even a trainer, even a new trainer who's got certifications and some of this stuff, they're not going to be effective because are they going to coach you through the process? Mm -hmm. When you fail, are you going to show up and, and are they going to say, oh, what will happen? How's your relationship to food? Be, oh, just eat what I told you, right? So that's a big reason why a doctor's uh, going to be ineffective or their advice is going to be ineffective. Especially, here's the other part. You have to consider where the, the, these are people that are highly disciplined when they want to be. And when you're talking to somebody who knows how to do that, sometimes they think you're the same way or it's easy. In other words, you can right. hear somebody say, just, just do it, just follow it and just do it. Just, you know, grind your way through it. Most people don't work that way. I know some people do, but most people simply don't. I used to remember, I remember I had an issue with that because I'm a fitness fanatic. So I thought, yeah. you know, we'll just get up and, and work out. Like, yeah. what's the big deal? Just get up and do I it. Get it. So All you got to do is just get up and do it. And then it's like, okay, well, it's not working. Yeah. Everybody's failing. Maybe the problem is me. Maybe the problem's not them. So the other thing is that uh, a doctor's toolkit, we're talking about Western medicine, is very, very good for acute issues. Like Western medicine, okay, if you have an acute issue, that is the that is the form of medicine you want. You're dying now, 
You want a Western medicine doctor. Something ruptures, like I'm going to yeah. the hospital. Arm breaks. Yeah. You, yeah. yeah. Something's happening now. I need medicine. I need, so, like, you want that now. Chronic issues, Western medicine, just because of the way it's organized, is terrible at dealing with chronic issues. If you have a skin condition, and the reason why you have a skin condition is because you don't get enough sunlight, you have a lot of stress, you don't get enough sleep. Um, the diet that you're eating, there's a few, couple, there's a few food intolerances that you're not Black aware of yet. Uh, and that's the answer. You ain't going to get that answer from Western medicine. No. What mm -hmm. you're going to get from Western medicine is here, rub this cream on it that brings down the inflammation and it makes the symptom kind of disappear. And, and losing weight, changing your, your, your relationship to exercise, becoming active for the rest of your life. This is not a, a, an acute solution. This is a more of a chronic issue. Obesity is chronic. It takes time, so you have to deal with it in that way. And their toolkit just isn't well. Why is that why way. is it that Western medicine is so bad for something chronic? Is it because it what it will do is is mask the root cause, and then it'll just manifest itself somewhere else? Is that because well, because if you're if you're if you're if you're dead, let's see your skin issue, and because I for example uh, my psoriasis, uh, and I went through this process going through Western yeah. medicine. Here's a, here's the steroid shots. Here's the steroid creams. Mm -hmm. Put it on it. Oh, when I put it on it, it it Relief. totally tam totally tamps it down. Relief. I don't itch as bad. It doesn't look as bad. But but then it flares up again. Yeah, constant. I'm constantly having to do all that stuff yeah. just to keep it down. And by the way, my body starts to adapt to those creams, and yep. then I have to rotate through right. other ones. Same thing with the steroid stuff. I have to do. And different you might change it out, and now yeah. you're going to have a different reaction from a different one of those creams. And right. so it's like a downstream effect. So if you're adding some kind of medication to address the symptom, now sometimes you might also have you know these other side effects that yep. now you have to treat the side effects alongside you know the actual treatment, and then it just kind of compiles which I think the chronic uh, issues, that's where the problem is. Right. Lies. Never once uh, a conversation around what's my diet like, uh, vitamin D, uh, infrared light or sunlight. Like none of that stuff was ever discussed. It's no just, lifestyle stuff. None at all. It was literally- In fact, you probably, they probably laughed at you. I bet you asked. I did. Yeah. I did. And they laughed at me. That was, it was it was years later. It was actually not until we we all got together. Was it you who said I brought up a study that said that vitamin D deficiency is very closely connected to psoriasis. And Adam's like, nobody ever told me. Yeah. I started taking vitamin D and it started to get yeah, better right away. <laughs> well, then I, then we had then we 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 went and got the test done because I hadn't even been I never even thought to test for vitamin D. Didn't even didn't even dawn on me that that might be an issue test for it, find out that I am really low. And I was really low even after taking 5,000 IUs. Mm -hmm. So I ended up having to bump it up to 10,000 because I was so low. So, yeah. you know, and it did, it made a huge difference. So did the Im infrared, so did just getting out and getting sunlight. So did avoiding foods that my body was obviously intolerant to. So there's, there were so many other things that actually could solve that problem that they weren't even speaking to. They're just going to constantly yeah, the, hammer the, the steroid cream. Yeah. The reason why Western medicine is, is the way it is with chronic stuff is because Western medicine medicine was extremely successful and was born out of solving acute issues, right? So when Western medicine really started taking hold, it was like, how do we solve uh, bacterial infections that killed millions of people all the time? Boom, antibiotics. Like what a breakthrough, right? Oh, yeah. Um, how do we solve these viral infections uh, that are, are, you know, polio, for example. Oh, we have a, a vaccine. Oh, mm. it's massive, massive breakthrough. Yeah. Surgeries. Oh my God, I'm bleeding. What do I'm gonna bleed out? What do I do? Right? Anesthesia, surgeries, like repairing bones, um, repairing, you know, arteries after heart attacks. Like it was brilliant and it worked, but it was built around that model of solving this kind of emergency issue. And so it was never baked into the system for this kind of like how do we solve like if you look at the problems today that Western medicine is really struggling with, you have like degenerative disorders. Um, autoimmune, autoimmune issues, right? Alzheimer's, dementia. You have uh, all the autoimmune issues: Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. colitis, psoriasis, uh, eczema, uh, allergies, food allergies, which are you know going through the heart disease, which is a, a chronic issue. Diabetes, you know. Um, we have all these chronic issues, and Western medicine yeah. just it's just terrible at working with these. You know, by the way, a lot of these we already know the answers to. Okay, a lot of them require total lifestyle changes. Now, part of the challenge is lifestyle changes are hard. Taking a pill is kind of easy. But nonetheless, it's it's not organized in a way to work with those types of things. So if you go see your doctor, um, how long do you spend with them? 
right? Mm -hmm. 10, 15 minutes. What are your symptoms? What's going on? Yeah. Let's do some tests. Here's this, you know, here's a pill or here's a thing. And I think we can take care of that, you know, that. And we that already know how much, uh, how difficult it is, you know, even as a coach to extract the, the right amount of data from your client and ask the right questions yeah. to really peer into their actual lifestyle. Cause we, we always present our best self. I mean, look at social media, we're always presenting our best self all the time, which is not helpful, uh, especially when you're coming in with a, with an issue that you really need to dive in and, and be transparent as possible. So yeah. I also think part of the challenge they have with with chronic issues, both everything from chronic pain to even like skin and diabetes yeah. and things like that, is that it's so individualized. So you could like yes. think, as, think of it as a trainer, like, okay, I have a client who has a bad hip. A bad hip could be caused the root cause could be a lot of different things. It doesn't it could be something to do with their foot. It could be has something to do with their knee. It could be something to do with their low back. Like it could be a do a, it could a, be inflammation. Yeah. It could be a yeah. lot of different it things. It could be emotional. Right. There could right. be a lot of different things that are causing that. And they just they don't have the time and effort to really troubleshoot all those it's different It's not their training. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, you have you have hip pain. Oh, here's a here's a here's a shot. Here's a shot real quick, or here's some pain medication. They're there to solve, or, or the, maybe we'll get yeah. you a surgery. Set right, yeah. which to them, it doesn't matter if the root cause came from your foot or came from inflammation or came from the fact that your right foot is one inch longer than your left foot. Like that, It's like, oh, you have pain in the area. This will dull the pain for sure. Yep. So, it, it could, and it will, so it umbrellas everybody. But the truth is if you want to get to the bottom of it and really solve the problem with chronic anything – You've got, you've got to diagnose every individual because every individual could have, yep. and they go like to psoriasis, my point. Psoriasis could be potentially caused from red meat or from asparagus for me. But or then gut it's, dysbiosis. Right, but or, then it's avocado and banana for somebody else, right? Or yeah, you have some sort of issue like, so I mean, it could be so many different things that, um, that, it could, that a, a doctor is not going to sit there and troubleshoot all no, that. No, and they have, and another problem is they have a drug for, most symptoms, right? Yeah. Most symptoms, there's a mm -hmm. drug that's been designed, most common symptoms, there's a drug that's designed to treat that. And drug companies have massive influence over our medical system. Um, it's like the supplement industry in fitness, right? It's, it's, it's the money-making mm -hmm. part of that industry. Now, I'm not going to demonize the drug and pharmaceutical industry. And I know that a lot of people think it's, it's popular to demonize them. Look, I'm gonna. I mean, to be quite honest, the pharmaceutical in industry has solved a lot of major yeah. issues. They spend a lot of money on research. Some of that research is brilliant and incredible. But they're an industry like anything else, and uh, there's there can always be, you know, things that are better. And if it's not prof, if something is not profitable, then it's very hard to fund the research that's needed. It's very hard to pass through regulations to make a drug, you know, even viable. So it's just, again, it's baked into the system. And then, of course, you throw on top of it that people run it. Yes. People can be greedy. They can be corrupt. They can be all those different things. So you mix that all together, and um, you get a lot of problems. So, I mean, I'll give you guys – I was actually having this conversation with Jessica yesterday. So my son, my youngest, he was having kind of like some like real mild rashes, like on the back of his knee, his elbow – and his digestion seemed a little off. Like his, 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 you know, when he would go, when he would, his stool would be either a little too soft or a little bit constipated. And, you know, obviously we're both in the wellness field. So we notice these things. And so we tell the pediatrician and we have a great pediatrician. Okay. We have a really good pediatrician, but still that's, again, the system is the way it is. And so she goes, oh, she goes, well, um, try putting, uh, let's, I'll get you some cortisone cream to put on the rash. Right now, Jessica and I are like, I, I, look, I don't care about the rash as much. First of all, it's not that bad. It's not like super bothering him. Yeah. But also, why does he have the rash? Like, okay, we put the cream on, but what's causing the rash? Yeah. So then we talked about the gut, and then you know he also had his breath was kind of smelling funny. So the doctor's like, well, you know what? Let's we can try this antibiotic. It's like, wait, <laughs> we don't know if there's a bacterial infection. Like, let's not do that yet. So what I did is I actually had to go through our friend Becky Campbell, Doctor Beck Campbell, who's a functional medicine practitioner. And they operate more holistically. So we did some testing. We saw some, there was some dysbiosis in his gut. We did a low histamine diet, put him on some antimicrobials, which are natural, right? Some herbal stuff. And it's all going away. Now imagine if we were like the average parent and just rubbed the cream on it. Didn't change anything else, right? right. We would have never solved right. any of those issues. And then that led us to another conversation about antibiotics. Now they're different about antibiotics now because now we have more information. But when we were kids- You said throw it at everything. Anything. Yeah. You were sick- any sneeze, cough, 
Rat, it doesn't matter. Boom! Throw antibiotics at it. Is it, it isn't that yeah. one of isn't that one of the prevailing theories on the explosion of autoimmune in our generation? They think they think that mm. may play a role because it, it really messes up with your micro, messes with your microbiome and your immune system. Yeah. In fact, the microbiome we knew we had bacteria in our body, but we had no idea in the eighties when we were kids. Yeah. They had no idea what how its integrated role. it was. Yeah. None. So they would throw antibiotics at everything. Mice. My siblings and I, I was By on way, antibiotics some, so many some, times. Some right? some doctors still do this. I know. It's still, I mean, we know more information about it, but it's still, calm. I, luckily, I have a really good pediatrician who's actually like super, we, that's our last, last resort we would ever do, but there's still some that, like, that's the first thing they do. Yeah. They still I mean, it at it. and you know that a majority, for example, uh, like a, a large chunk of when people have like a, a chest infection is viral. Not bacterial, so you're gonna throw antibiotics at it, uh, but that doesn't do anything, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then people get better because they're gonna get better anyway. So then they think it's, but nonetheless, this has led to uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Now we know that this isn't so great. But man, when I was a kid, I was I must have taken antibiotics 15 different times. My siblings, so many different times. So, but now they're starting to kind of figure this out. But my point with that is, is they had a drug for a symptom, and it was like treat the treat the symptom, throw the, throw the antibiotics at it, which mm -hmm. is not a, a really dealing with the necessarily the root cause. Maybe they thought they were, but wasn't necessarily. And so that's what happens. So if you go, when you have pain, look, I tell you what, you go to your doctor and you tell them you have a lot of pain, they'll prescribe you a painkiller, mm -hmm. you know, and they won't necessarily look at the, the root cause. You might have to go through a few specialists before that actually happens. Like my head hurts. Here's a painkiller keeps happening. Well, maybe they'll spend you to send you to a specialist that works with the central nervous system or right. with the brain or whatever, but you got to go through a bunch of different channels. Yeah, and I was experiencing that and just had headaches, just constant headaches. And, you know, had to go through a lot of specialists to finally figure it out. It was like an underlying tumor that was creating the, these high blood pressure moments when I'd wake up and, um, you know, would give me this like chronic headache pain. But to me, I could treat it, right? I could always just, you know, take some Excedrin, and then, you know, I'd be fine for, you know, uh, the rest of the day. But then, you know, what my kidneys, my liver, like everything else, it's just like, so you just got to consider like all the downstream, the, the long-term effects of like just focusing on the symptom. Yes. And now the biggest point is this, is that do the, the way the system is designed, they don't have the time yeah. to walk you through and coach you and train you and handle and work with lifestyle issues. And it's funny when I, when, again, I, I train a lot of doctors, we would talk about this and I'd say, man, our, our medicine, medical system, some stuff that's really messed up and they would agree. And they'd say, but Sal, you know how hard it is to get people to take their medications. Do you guys know that it's like a huge percentage of people just forget to take their like life-saving medications, like blood pressure medication. Mm -hmm. He goes, and you think I'm going to tell someone to start exercising and eating right? Right. And they're going to do that? And I, it's like, they, we don't have the time to deal with that kind of stuff. I don't, I'm not going to be able to sit there and coach them. So, you know, this is the biggest reason why, you know, now I think a, a doctor can tell you what not to do, especially if you've had surgeries or if you have a medical condition, like, um, you know, if you have certain blood pressure issues or if you're on a beta blocker, I would need to know that as a trainer before checking your heart rate, you know, and, and doing certain exercises. But uh, if, an, if a doctor says, yeah, you need to exercise and, and eat right, that's good advice. That's fine. It's the what, like the specifics that I think you probably don't necessarily want to listen to. Well, that's why, yeah, you got to kind of consider, you got to be an advocate for yourself, an advocate for your own health. So you're going to go to a doctor and if, especially if it's a general practitioner to that point, they're not going to have a whole lot of time to sit and discuss, you know, all those options and troubleshoot, you know, and there are other options for you to go to from there and other doctors you can get second opinions from and, you know, try to do some sleuthing, some, some work there and some detective work to kind of dive a little bit deeper. Yeah. That the most important part of this conversation, I really think is that people need to understand that there there's, a lot more you can do than what you may think based off of what you've heard from your doctor, right? Like, cause to you, all these points that we're bringing up of why yeah, that's true. It, it, and, and that's what, I mean, this is part of the, the motivation uh, with the partnership that we have with Dr. Cabral and their team um, and, and why we've provided a free forum where they, where people have access is a lot of clients in my experience just didn't know. 
just were unaware because they're again doctor prescribed it doctor tells yeah. them they just assume that oh i i went and saw him or her yeah, it's like a sentence they said, said i have these issues here's the medication for it here's mm -hmm. the steroid for it here's the shot for it here's the prescription for it and so therefore that's what i do there's no there was never this conversation of Oh, there's there's other things we could also look into. You know, it's that that so they just are unaware that there is some sort of a root cause that you could potentially either exercise and figure out, or change your diet and figure out, or mm -hmm. do testing and figure out with your gut. Like, there's so many other things that you can potentially do, and I think that that's the most important part of this conversation. It's less about doctors are bad, trainers are great, yeah. or it's no. it's not that. It's that. I understand the reasons why they do the things they do or they say some of the things that they say. As a consumer, you need to understand that there a lot of times there are a lot more options than you think there are just based off of, you know, all the different research that we know about chronic pain and chronic issues when it comes to both diet and movement. There's a lot of stuff that you yeah. can do besides just take the pill or the shot. They're really really good at what they're trained to do. Yeah. Outside of that, you're 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 it's it's Similar to asking someone who has no training. It's very similar in that sense. Now, except you're dealing with probably a smart, a smarter, more intelligent type person. Still, they're really good at what they do. It's like asking your mechanic uh, to teach you how to how to race your car. You know, they might not know how to race a car, but they know how your car works. Yeah, they have all the the they know the parts inside. So that's the big point, and um, uh, the specifics are where you got to be careful. But mm -hmm. other than that, I think you said you made this comment, Justin. I think this is very important. You have to be your own advocate. And you have to go and do the do the reading, find more people, ask more people, and don't give up. Especially if you have a chronic issue that doesn't you you, you can't seem to have a solution, and it can take some time. I know people took five years yeah. mm -hmm. to figure out. That's uh, the other thing. It takes it yeah. takes a long time. That's yeah. a, that's a, that's also the other challenge is, you know, when I when I went like using my psoriasis as an example, and I got the steroid shot and the cream, the next day I saw a significant difference. Mm -hmm. And so there's this kind of feedback loop of, oh, this works or this yeah. is amazing. Where if I were to try and address the root cause of it, testing, teasing some foods out, you know, changing the diet up, maybe trying to get more sunlight, adding vitamin. I mean, there's all these things. And then, it, and then even when I start doing those things yeah. and being I consistent, got to be it. consistent yeah. with it for a while for yeah. the body. So, you know, it's that that's part of the challenge. But, you know, if you're listening to this and you, you battle with any sort of crime and you're not in our free forum, um, you have to take advantage of that. that, that and we have doctors it. in there, too. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, no, we have doctors in there for that. And they're answering questions. They get on there every week and and do live live stuff. So uh, if you're not in that free forum, you're you're missing out. For What's sure. the name of that one? Is it MP Holistic, Holistic Health? Health? MP Holistic Health on Facebook. It's a free forum and it's run by Dr. Stephen Cabral, Functional Medicine uh, practitioner and his team. So great place. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find us all on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. The rules that apply to somebody who is going from, a man who's going from 20% body fat to 15%, the rules that apply to that person are the same as the, all the rules. All the same that go from 10% to 5%. The difference is everything that we talked about.